Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today at our policy engagement for researchers, how to engage with government in contrast to parliament training. You're very welcome at our session this afternoon. So my name's Naomi. I'm part of the Knowledge Exchange Unit at the UK Parliament. We support and strengthen the exchange of information and expertise between Parliament and the research community. Uh, we do that in various ways. So we provide training. We uh, have online resources about how to work with Parliament as a researcher. Um, we promote opportunities for researchers to work with Parliament. We run academic fellowships and we're really a point of contact uh, for anyone wishing to engage with Parliament as a researcher. Um, so I'm joined on um, this call today by some colleagues from Parliament. Uh, my colleague, Laura, uh, who will be picking up your questions um, as we go through the session and my colleague, Sarah, as well. And um, we've also got some uh, fantastic speakers from across government who will be joining us today. Uh, we have Julia and Catherine from the Government Office for Science, uh, Olivia from the Open Innovation Team and Amy from the Ministry of Justice. So just before I pass over to our first speakers from government, I just wanted to refresh your knowledge about the difference between parliament and government. So parliament is the House of Commons, our MPs. It's the House of Lords, peers, um, and the Queen is officially a part of parliament as well. Uh, parliament's role is to hold government to account, to make and pass legislation, uh, and to check and approve government spending proposals. So enable the government to raise and spend money. And uh, government, on the other hand, uh, the executive is some MPs, some members of the House of Lords who've been chosen by the Prime Minister to be ministers, to run government departments and public services, um, and uh, they are accountable back to Parliament. So the people that we're going to be hearing from today are working within those government services and government departments. Um, and I'm talking about government as if it's one entity. But of course, it's lots and lots of many different parts. Um, and what we wanted to do today is to give you an insight into um, three different parts of government, uh, how they work with experts and, and how you can be involved. So that is our aim. Um, and I'm really pleased to introduce you um, to Julia Cucato, who is uh, Head of Science uh, Capability, Advice and Leadership at the Government Office for Science. And Catherine Leach, who is a policy advisor in academic engagement at the Government Office for Science. And I'm going to hand you over to Julia. Uh, Julia, you've got until just after quarter past two to uh, tell us a bit about Government Office for Science and how researchers can engage. So it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Naomi. Thank you for this uh, very good introduction and thank you for uh, inviting us to present. So um, today, in collaboration with my colleague Catherine Leach, um, I will attempt to provide a quick guide for, academ for academics to engage with the government, and in particular, I'm going to focus on Go Science, Government Office for Science, which is the department I work in. And uh, the presentation will be followed by a, a Q&A. As part of this presentation, um, I will provide a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Uh, and then I will um, move on to Catherine, who will uh, present her, the results of uh, her deep dive into how we do academic engagement uh, in Go Science, in the Government Office for Science, which affectionately we call Go Science. Um, we will focus on how you can get um, involved and uh, we'll try to provide some top tips on working with us. Um, Go Science, um, I would like to tell you now who the Government Office for Science is. So um, it's a group of uh, science and policy advisors who sit between central government and other government departments. We are nominally part of BASE, but effectively act independently in supporting advice to the PM and across government for science. Our overarching aim is to strengthen science systems in government in order to provide be a better evidence base for decision making and prompt science advice to policy. Um, so you see here our uh, boss, who is uh, Patrick Valance. Uh, we report, uh, we all report to him and uh, Patrick uh, advises directly the Prime Minister and also is involved in a lots of groups across government that work across government to provide science advice. One of them is SAGE, for which uh, I suppose more or less everyone know at this point. 
the Independence Council for Science and Technology, and um, he's involved in futures and foresight projects. So uh, the government office for science is organized in six different directorates, each one led by a deputy director. Um, and these are the ones listed here. So the Science Systems and Capability Directorate is the one in which Catherine and I both sit, but we've also got one that looks at futures, one that takes care of security and resilience, one that takes care of global issue, issues and opportunities between which, for example, COP26 and the G7, this kind of uh, activities. And then there's two directorates that are directly involved in the COVID-19 emergency, providing both providing advice and strategy. So if we want to go a little bit more into the details of what we do, um, we can look at the teams in Go Science that actually do um, active academic engagement. So the Futures and Emerging Technology team um, runs lots of different projects that go from identifying emerging technologies to doing a series of horizon scanning exercises to identify the trends that are important in the, in the future to look at. The security and resilience team is the one that runs the scientific advisory group for emergencies. And then the science systems and capability team, which is the one in which I, myself and Catherine work, is the one that works with uh, academics, mostly using areas of research interest um, and um, works with the academies, so the national academies. In the government office for science, we also provide secretariat to many groups of external advisors uh, and government advisors. The, the most important ones being the Chief Scientific Advisory Network, Advisor Network. So each government department has a Chief Science Advisor, which is our hub of connection between government and academia. And they meet regularly um, in, in well, now on Teams, and we facilitate their meetings. Uh, then, obviously, we provide secretariat for the science uh, scientific advisory group for emergency for the Council for Science and Technology, which is the, the council that provides direct advisor advice to the prime minister in the form of letters, mostly. And then there's the uh, chair of science advisor, uh, chair, chair of science advisory councils meeting, which is uh, um, a group of chairs of the science advisory council, which are, which are a group of experts that sit just a little bit outside government department to provide advice to the CSA, to the Chief Science Advisor. Um, so in my team, as I mentioned, the Science Systems and Capability team, we mainly uh, conduct academic engagement through documents that are called areas of research interest. So the areas of research interest for the, for, uh, who don't, the people that don't know what these documents are, are published documents, so, so it is really important they're published, so they are open to everybody, uh, in which government departments set out the most important, important research questions, which they feel they cannot answer in-house, so you know, in which they invite academics for collaboration. Um, these have been used extensively, most more recently, um, and, and, and shared uh, with many of uh, the collaboration, the collaborators you can see uh, in this slide. Um, I would like to go now into the details of a particular proof of principle of use of these areas of research interest, which we did in our teams. Uh, last spring, so in the middle of the COVID emergency, we realized as a team that we were sitting on an enormous amount of information, thanks to these ARI documents. And um, thanks to the fact that I was also uh, and I also had the privilege at the time to be collaborating with two excellent academics, which are, were seconded in science th through um, a fellowship from uh, the Research Council, the ESRC. Um, we worked together at looking at 1,500 published ARIs um, to understand, if we, to see if we could identify some themes that would be relevant in the long term, in the medium to long term. Um, response to the emergency to the COVID emergency. So not focusing focusing on the on the science questions on the, on the um, medical questions, but just on the social so societal questions. Looking at the 1500 ARIs we had already and filtering it according to, to this particular uh, lens, 
we uh, identified nine themes that would be relevant in the response to the emergency uh, in the long term. This around, these 19 themes are listed here, and you can see in this slide the chairs that we uh, gave to each one of, this, of these themes and around which we, um, we grouped nine working groups. So using the expertise of uh, Annette and Catherine, who had lots of uh, very, very good networks actually across university and with the fundamental help of UPenn, who gave us a list of uh, a, a very long list of academics, we created nine working groups around these themes and task them over the spring and summer, and we finished eventually in the autumn this year, last year, to uh, identify existing evidence and evidence gaps against each of the ARI questions they had. Um, this work, the results of these works are linked on slide seven of this presentation, which I think we're going to share. The work has been already very influential in identifying research agendas relevant in the recovery, and we're seeing more and more uh, results of this work as time goes by. I think this is my time is up now, and I would like to pass on uh, uh, the, the presentation to my colleague Catherine, who is going to look a little bit more into the details of how we do academic engagement in Go Science. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, just very quickly then to, to show you what I've um, been finding off the back of the ARI works. Um, we see our areas of research interest as being a great success for reaching out to academics who haven't been involved before and also with our, our publications and um, getting more interest from different groups of people who can feed into these. Um, these are the areas that Julia has pointed out that our teams are working with that you can be involved in. So are the ways that we currently engage and that you can join us. So um, from the graph, we had a quick survey when we started the Rebuilding Resilient Britain project where we asked our um, chief scientific advisors the ways in which their departments currently engaged with academics. And you can see the usual routes, our research projects, uh, internships and fellowships and different advisory groups, all of which we are interested in your participation. So you can see some um, quick ways of finding out about those are to subscribe to mailing lists. I'm pointing you in particular to UPenn who have an excellent cascade system for reaching different uh, people. We hope you're part of that. Um, blogs often advertise these opportunities and you can follow us on social media as well. I know some particular opportunities that are coming up at Go Science are um, some internships and secondments that will be live in 2021-22. So please look out for those. And finally, to wrap up um, our top three tips, sorry, there are the links and opportunities for you to get in touch with people that you can see um, when the slides are shared with you. Um, I'd like to recommend these things for you to, to get involved with government. First of all, to find those connections. So hear about our opportunities through different routes and um, the mailing lists and social media that I pointed out. Um, making connections. It's not always a direct route to getting your work into uh, influencing policy in government, but if you're part of, of lots of different networks, teams, groups, um, you can get your research heard and, and feed into policy in these ways. And finally, don't be discouraged if you don't feel like you're making an immediate impact. It is a long game, so please uh, join in in what ways you can and stay engaged. Finally, don't discount yourself. If you see these calls and you think that you don't count yourself as being an expert, um, we still want to hear from you. Whatever stage of your career you're at, it's important that we recognise your voice. So um, please reach out to us using the links we provided in these slides. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Julia and Catherine. Um, so we've had some great questions coming in whilst you've been talking. Uh, first of all, put this to uh, you both. Um, do you have to be a UK national to be eligible to apply to one of the working groups? So I really don't think so. Uh, as far as I know, uh, we've got, especially for example on SAGE and on other groups, we've got uh, um, experts that are non UK nationals. Um, because especially the groups that are external to government don't even require the clearance and various steps that might require if you were a civil servant. So I don't think there is any problem in collaborating with these groups if you are a non-UK non national. Um, next question we've had in here is, um, can academics contribute in the setting of their ARIs? And if so, how? So um, yes, they can. 
Uh, we are encouraging government departments to cast their net as wide as possible when they're writing and approaching the writing of their ARIs. We know some departments are actively engaging uh, already, but we are encouraging all departments to do so. And uh, obviously, all the uh, knowledge brokers like UPenn, uh, like UPenn can be very helpful in uh, putting you in contact with uh, government departments that might be interested in writing ARIs with you. Another great question here. So are the ARIs selected as part of the government manifesto promises in terms of putting forward new initiatives or new policies? So um, ARIs are research questions. Uh, they can influence uh, the research agenda. Um, and as part of that, they are meant to be aligned with the government with government policy, uh, because that's what, what the priorities of government are. Uh, but they're not directly linked to the government manifesto. We've got uh, another question here. So could you please say a little bit more about the key knowledge broker, uh, UPenn, um, that the second uh, presenter uh, mentioned? I think that was Catherine. Their definition is the university's policy engagement network. So if you want to look them up, you can do, but Julie can tell you a little bit more about the way they work. Yeah. So UPenn is a, is a network of uh, uh, universities. So there's, a, um, I think, uh, um, over 50, but I don't know the exact number, to be honest, because it changes anyway. So there are more people uh, uh, joining the group. And they're basically uh, all connected across, uh, across, the, across the UK to provide connection between, between policy and academics. So when there are policy questions that could be interesting for the academics in the in the department, they will pass them on. So a uh, question here, can think tank researchers respond in the same way or only academic researchers? Um, and relatedly, is there any restrictions on type of organisation who can get involved? Not in principle. ARIs are, if we're talking about ARIs specifically, they're written by government departments and each government department has a slightly different approach to ARIs. Uh, we um, are being encouraged more and more to consider industry when we think about this kind of engagement because there's a wealth of knowledge in industry that is very much academic, but we just don't call it academic. So um, it's it's very much part of, a, of the engagement that we encourage to do. Julia and Catherine, thank you so much for giving us an insight into the Government Office for Science and ARIs and answering those questions. And Laura, thanks for keeping an eye on those. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our next speaker, who is Olivia O'Sullivan, uh, who is a senior policy advisor at the Open Innovation Team. Olivia, I'm really pleased you can join us today and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So it's over to you. Thanks, Naomi, um, and thanks so much to our lovely colleagues at POST for um, inviting me to come and give this presentation on the Open Innovation Team and what we do. Um, so we were asked to just give a brief overview of our work, explain who we are and um, speak to uh, you researchers about the opportunities that there are to work with us and more broadly about how we tend to work with sort of outside academic experts. So to take each of those in turn, um, the Open Innovation Team, of which I'm a part of, uh, is a small cross-government unit um, and we exist to help sort of bridge the gap between academics and policymakers. Um, we, the way we work is that we actually work for other teams all across government, so we get commissioned to support live policy projects as they're happening or to help support policy decisions with a synthesis of evidence, bring in academics to talk through policy ideas, um, or new ways of approaching a problem with policymakers. So unlike some of the other teams that you spoke to today, I suppose the main distinction is that we're quite agnostic in terms of the policy area that we're looking at. Um, and we almost act like a consultancy. We get commissioned to help and add capacity um, to live policy projects as they're going on. Um, and we have different team members with different specific backgrounds and specialisms. We're all experienced civil servants. We don't focus on one particular aspect of policy. Instead, we try to act as a bit of a bridge and an interpreter. And these are our sort of main categories of work. So we do engagement, which we think of as ways to get academics and policymakers talking and working with each other. So things like organising workshops, 
putting together seminar series. So ever since uh, lockdown began, we've been doing kind of intermittent series of seminars on COVID, bringing in researchers to speak to civil servants about their latest research on all the different policy impacts and latest evidence on how COVID and how lockdown is affecting people in the UK and around the world. And we've been really pleased with that because we've had sort of hundreds of civil servants from different departments coming to hear what academics have to say about really emergent research and ideas. Our other category is analysis. So we work with academics and others to uh, get across a whole area of literature and try to synthesize it for our colleagues in a really policy relevant and digestible way. And finally, ideas. So we try to bring in kind of leading thinkers or maybe experts that government doesn't usually hear from. Um, perhaps they're not the obvious choice or they're younger or newer researchers. Um, and we work with our policy customers and colleagues to help kind of take their ideas forward or see new ideas and change the conversation that they're having about a policy area. This is just a few stats about how we've been doing since 2019. The teams actually existed since 2016, but we were only kind of small pilot at that point. And in 2019, we really expanded a lot more. There's about 12 of us now. Um, We've worked with over 300 academics. We've delivered about 30 projects since, since that time when we expanded in January 2019. And uh, we gather feedback from policy uh, colleagues on the service we provide. So we try to focus on making it a really good, positive experience and kind of leaving people with a bit more of an expert network than they previously had. So just a little bit on how we do this in more depth. I've included a couple of examples. I've covered this a bit, but if, you if we take our main area, our area of work engagement, the way we tend to do that is through things like workshops, expert panels and seminars. Um, the way we tend to do analysis is we produce different types of reports, sometimes a very short, rapid review of what top experts have to say on a policy issue, sometimes a much more detailed, uh, deep dive piece of research, or sometimes we broker a new piece of research. We kind of help policymakers define what the actual right question is that they need to ask. And then we work with academics to to see if that kind of research can be done. So a good example of some of our engagement work is we worked for a team in the cabinet office called the National Leadership Centre. The National Leadership Centre, their purpose is to support public sector leaders all across the country. And they wanted help with defining this is a very broad brief. They wanted help with defining their research agenda. So we worked with about 60 experts uh, all around the country who think about leadership and management in different ways. Um, we mapped a network of those experts and we organised four workshops to help the National Leadership Centre define their research agenda, build a network to help guide their work and find outside expert advise, advisors to um, inform what they were doing. This is just a few pictures of our, our workshops, which we ran in uh, February to March last year. So last real opportunity for in-person workshops. Um, another quick example is more of a kind of in-depth analysis project that we did. We worked with colleagues in the DfE to think about teacher recruitment. Um, Department for Education officials, they were kind of concerned that they had lots of metrics about teacher recruitment and retention as an ongoing policy issue. How do you recruit and retain teachers? But they particularly wanted to review the evidence on how you attract people who are most likely to be good teachers. Is there a way to know that? Is there a way to look for the best possible skills? Uh, is it to do with commitment to teaching? Is it to do with your academic qualifications? Is it some kind of mixture of those sorts of things? So we brought together um, a group of experts for a workshop and we ended up working very closely with one academic in York who'd been looking at this question for a lot of his career. We wrote a deep dive report in collaboration with him and with officials of the DfE, drawing on the opinions of about 30 experts from around the world. Um, so a bit of a blueprint started to emerge there for a kind of new approach to teacher recruitment. The project is a little bit stalled because of COVID, um, but certainly not forgotten. Um, and that's a really nice example, we think, of kind of a way that we've helped bridge a kind of really interesting emergent area of academic evidence with a live ongoing policy problem that the DfE wanted to help with. So if you are interested in working with us, what are some kind of general points um, and uh, information about how that happens? 
Well, the first thing to say is that we've done an, a lot of work now with uh, academics from all sorts of different disciplines, and we've come up with a few sort of ground rules for just thinking about policy impact in general. So if you've done a lot of this already, this won't be new to you, probably come to similar conclusions yourself, but it's worth keeping in mind a few sort of central tips. So whatever strategy you pursue, whatever policy area you're interested in working in or, or department or part of government you're interested in working with, always thinking about using multiple routes to influence. There are almost always more than one group of people working on a policy problem inside of government, as well as people outside of government who often pressure and influence the conversation going on inside. So think about that wider influencing context. Um, and on that basis, proactively establish wide networks. So don't be shy about getting in touch. Don't be shy about thinking of multiple ways that you can um, build up your uh, people that you know who are working on a policy area. And this one we find is especially useful to academics. Try to present yourself as a guide to the wider evidence base and don't discount your kind of broader body of subject knowledge rather than just being an advocate for your own research or just the latest uh, piece of research that you've done. Academics are often used, we find, to um, having to sort of think about a specific research project or, or trying to get policymakers to look at one specific research project. That makes total sense given uh, the way sort of research incentives work, but a really good way to build up a network is to bring, present yourself as someone who is a uh, sort of pragmatic and informed guide to a whole area who maybe knows other academics who can work with others who um, can speak to more than just the latest piece of evidence that um, they've been working on. And above all, be patient and persistent. Government is a big, confusing, bureaucratic edifice. There is quite high turnover, but you can get really good results if you sort of stay in it and stay, keep build a broad network and work with lots of people. We tend to think of um, academic research and the way that it can interact with policy in two modes. So one mode is supply led and the other mode is demand led. So a supply led strategy um, tends to be when you have you have research and you want officials to look at it. So you're supplying them with your research and that can be a very difficult way to get officials interested. It might not be quite the right time for them to be looking at something that you've been doing but it can work well if you follow a few principles. So cast your net wide, build those big networks, make contact with lots of different people. Um, don't be knocked back if the first kind of uh, civil servant or public body or advisory board that you get in touch with doesn't seem that interested. Um, have a hook, make a really specific offer. Sometimes um, when you get in touch with someone in government, it doesn't quite work because although what you're doing is really interesting, they're just not too sure what to do with it right now. So if you can make a kind of specific offer, whether it's could I come in and or could I organise a seminar with me and my colleagues and talk about our research area? Um, even if they say no, you've sort of helped uh, make it clear what sort of thing you're interested in doing. Um, and finally, this is where we're probably stretching the fishing metaphor a bit too far, but use a law. So make it really easy for people to read your brief, be really concise. Um, if you do send written work, that is, or even in just an approach email, keep it really simple and really clear. The other side is a demand led strategy. So that's when officials have a demand. They have a policy question that they very rapidly often need the answer to or want some help with thinking through. Um, and as uh, experts with lots of um, useful kind of research and evidence to add, you can serve that demand. But that often involves by necessity waiting for the right moment when policymakers, when that question will come up. So one of the best things you can do is be ready for that. So what we usually advise is be findable. It's really worth having a very up to date shop window, probably updating your profile page on your academic institutions website is very low down one's to do list, which is completely understandable, but it's really worth having your credentials clearly explaining your research in a non expert friendly manner um, either on your university profile or even better maintain your own simple website where you have a kind of collection of all your research. Um, Obviously, be credible. So policymakers, like anyone else, use citations and research contributions to think about, you know, whether somebody is um, the right person to get in touch with on a particular issue. But it's also really good to demonstrate that you think in policy terms and you take part in policy debates. So 
it may seem uh, not that useful if you've ever kind of spoken on a panel about a policy issue and they put a clip of it up on YouTube, but sometimes that's exactly the kind of thing we look at to kind of get an understanding of how somebody thinks about an issue and before we get in touch with them. Or, you know, if you've given evidence to select committees, for example, which is something that you would do with parliament, not government, um, that's still really useful to government and often policymakers take a look at recent select committee um, hearings to find really credible and interesting experts. And finally, be flexible. Policymakers might get in touch with a question that doesn't perfectly map onto your research. So it's really worth thinking about how your expertise might inform the debate more broadly. That doesn't mean you have to sort of stretch yourself into an area that you're not qualified to speak to. It's obviously fine to say no if somebody's getting in touch and they've sort of got your focus wrong. But think about whether you can be that kind of flexible guide to the general area that um, I spoke about earlier. Most of our work comes from demand led projects. So policymakers come to us with a question and then we actively look for experts that are going to help inform that conversation and improve the quality of that conversation and help those policymakers make decisions. So it's really worth thinking through all of that stuff about being findable, being credible. That's our bread and butter. We do it all the time. So even though those things might seem simple, it's really worth investing a little bit of time in just setting yourself up as a really findable, credible expert. All of that does require building your profile and network in advance, which I recognise is really time consuming and we know academics like policymakers are really busy. So there are a few quick practical steps that you can invest in. Um, so do things like sign up for email alerts for policy papers and consultations in a relevant area to you on gov.uk. Maybe sign up for something like a Westminster briefing email. Find out if there's a kind of expert advisory panel in your in the policy area that would be relevant to you. Sometimes those are much more public and it's easier to find emails and get in touch with them and ask about their work than it is to find the relevant government team. You can work with others to monitor the development of a policy issue together and figure out when might be the right time to see if you can find someone in government to speak to about it. Um, and we also like probably many of the teams in this uh, event, do things like um, put call outs for experts on UPenn, the University Policy Engagement Networks, emails and other kind of similar mailing lists. So sign yourself up for those and make sure you're checking regularly. And finally, say hello. Um, one of the reasons that our team exists is to be a kind of helpful entry point when often it's very confusing and difficult to know how you can work with or speak to the relevant people in government. So don't be shy to get in touch with us. Let us know a bit about your research. Um, just so that we know who you are and when the right opportunity arises, we can get back in touch. Thanks very much. Uh, Olivia, thank you so much for an absolutely brilliant tour of your work and some really practical advice and tips for our researchers on how they can work with you. Uh, unfortunately, because of some technical issues, we can't put any of your questions to Olivia right now. Uh, we'll move on straight to our next speaker. I'm really pleased uh, to introduce you to Amy Summerfield, who is the Head of Evidence and Partnerships um, at Ministry of Justice. And Amy, we are really looking forward to hearing from you a little bit about how Ministry of Justice uh, works with experts and some tips on how experts can work with you. Amy, over to you. Sure. Thanks, Naomi. Thank you for having me um, here today. As Naomi said, I'm Amy Summerfield and I'm I'm head of the Evidence and Partnerships Hub at the Ministry of Justice. I've worked for the MOJ um, and its arm's length body for 10-ish or so, give or take a couple of years, um, in um, a variety of different uh, policy facing and research roles um, and currently head of the Evidence and Partnerships Hub. So I'm going to very quickly whiz through uh, what my team does at the MOJ, why we think it's so important um, and uh, some of the functions and activities that we're delivering through the hub that enable you to um, get involved with working with us. So just a very brief bit of context, um, as most of you will know, um, the MOJ is a major government department. Um, it's one of the most central uh, large government departments with significant policy responsibilities across England and Wales. Um, that, and the policy remit affects some of the most vulnerable people in society. Uh, our remit can cover overseeing the building and maintenance of the new prisons estate to interventions that 
uh, they're intended to reduce reoffending, to making decisions about where um, a child should live to, um, in order to protect their well-being. So I uh, work within the Data and Analytical Services Directorate, which is a central team within um, MOJ. Um, and our very broad remit is to provide um, greater evidence and insights to drive improvements to policy making um, and improve outcomes for justice system users. Um, I'm part of a diverse community of professional analysts, so I'm, I'm a um, government social researcher, but I work alongside economists, operational researchers, data scientists, data engineers, um, to, in, in order to um, provide the rounded evidence base that is needed for policy. We work alongside um, our colleagues in policy, but also operational colleagues in prisons and courts um, and finance colleagues um, through the use of an interrogation of data and evidence to support their decision making. So the evidence and partnerships um, is a relatively new team. I, I, I feel like I've been saying that for about 12 months, but it's because we're a very small team, um, three people, including me, um, with, but we have big ambitions um, and that is to drive a cultural change across um, MOJ to really maximise the use of um, data and evidence to um, improve, shape and improve fundamental decisions uh, for policy to redefine DASD's vision to improve justice outcomes. So um, the aims of the uh, hub are there, but in two broad buckets, we have um, the evidence strategy, which is um, we're responsible for, de for developing and embedding and refreshing the evidence strategy. And this is a comprehensive assessment of the evidence landscape um, that's been agreed with our, um, with our partners, uh, which outlines where our evidence priorities are and where the critical gaps are and where the, where the main barriers may be to filling those. Um, and then the other broad bucket is our partnership strategy, which I'll focus a bit more um, on today, given given the audience. But the, the partnership strategy is essentially um, we've defined a more comprehensive, coordinated approach to our engagement with academic and research networks and experts, um, which is underpinned by the ARI, which was touched on in the previous presentation. And the, the aim of this strategy is for us to have a more porous relationship between government and academia. We, we want to work alongside our academic um, and research uh, partners, utilising opportunities for better engagement and collaboration to enhance our combined strategic research capabilities um, to, uh, to inform policy making. Essentially, as 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 my job is to kind of sell the the vision across the the department, you can't you can't make the best evidence based decisions without the best evidence, and you can't have the best evidence if you're just looking um, within our four walls. So this is some of the functions of the hub. Um, some of them are very embryonic stage, um, but these are some of the things that we would like um, people to get involved in. I'm not going to go through them all today because of, of the time, of time, but to, uh, we can share these with you. Um, I'll focus on the areas of research interest. So the areas of research interest that's been uh, touched on already is aiming to have a better alignment between science and research with government policy and operational decision making. Um, MOJ's areas of research interest initially was published in 2018 and we've updated it very recently. I say very recently, it's May already, but December 2020. Um, and uh, as was mentioned, it can be found on gov.uk with the ARIs of other government departments. Um, the MOJ ARI was based on the evidence strategy, but it is um, presented along um, within the themes of the department's um, uh, most significant um, policy remit um, and outlines some example questions, uh, overarching themes and some example questions. It's just a visual representation of um, what's covered in our 
um, areas of research interest. Now, I won't go into too much detail of that, but we also, as you say, as, as, as I say, that, um, as well as the themes around policy areas, we also have um, some cross-cutting sections, um, either by thematic area, such as diversity or geography, but also um, some cross-cutting methodological um, and technical uh, themes that we would like to, um, uh, to in, in order to enhance our evidence base. I want to talk to you about one of the other functions of, of our hub, which is the academic network. Uh, so the, the academic network essentially is a, is a database of um, academic and research partners who have agreed uh, to have their contact details and areas of expertise to be shared within the department and have, have consented for us to contact them um, in relation to any research needs of the department, but also importantly, uh, potential collaborations um, between uh, the department and academics. Uh, the academic network is growing all the time. Um, in order to make sure that we are making connections with a broad range of um, researchers with um, across the spectrum of disciplines and expertise, uh, we're continually looking to um, develop the academic network. And I'd encourage um, researchers to get in touch and join the network if they feel they have research or expertise that would be relevant um, for the MOJ. Um, particular the and and the areas of research interest, and this will enable um, you to share the latest published and emerging evidence with analysts and policymakers within DASD, provide advice about the implications of evidence for policy. You may be invited to take part in policy round roundtables or advisory groups, uh, lead or take part in seminars and other ex other knowledge exchange um, events and find out more about potential avenues for the co-creation of research and collaboration opportunities. A big um, project within, within the hub is a, is a data linking program called Data First. Um, this is an externally funded program um, by ADR UK and this uh, has enabled the department to invest in its data infrastructure to make best use of the data it already collects through uh, the operation of its systems. Um, so it will essentially link administrative data collected from the prisons, the courts, probation, family courts, link them together um, and make these uh, research ready, de-identified data sets available for um, academic access um, via secure platforms. Um, and this, this um, the project itself has been designed for us to facilitate links between, um, between government and academia by making these uh, data sets available um, externally, but also working, um, we have a programme of events and um, activities to uh, identify um, research questions um, with academics and the potential for joint projects to make best use of the data. This details a little bit more around some of the engagement we have via the Data First programme. Um, so we hold academic seminars on a quarterly basis, um, which are very constructive and very well attended. These of um, the most recent one, for example, has focused on um, how the um, how feasible it is to answer some of MOJ's strategic ARI questions with the data that we're sharing via Data First, and through this program, we're also um, we're also launching um, have launched and continue to launch a, a rolling program of funding calls, so research fellowships to make use of the newly available data, and my team can help um, support you through that process. Um, to apply for research fellowships, as well as if you wanted to apply independently for um, access to the data. There's a ton of information embedded within the links on, um, on this page for, um, for you to find out further, um, further details. So um, I've touched on this throughout, throughout, um, throughout my presentation about the opportunities to engage with us. Um, but if we go on to the next slide and I'll just summarise 
so firstly uh, join our academic network that will give you a sense that that um make to make sure that we're engaging with a with the breadth of um academic experts that we uh, we need to um we want we want to make sure that we're um, engaging with early career and mid-career researchers as well as um, more senior and established um, researchers that may have been sort of uh, relied upon uh, for policy um, for sort of years and years. Um, secondly, just get in touch. We, uh, as I say, we're a small team and we're hoping, but we're hoping to build the team. But if you feel like you've got um, research that you feel might, might be able to help us address some of the critical evidence gaps outlined in the ARI, get in touch. Or if you, um, if you are considering submitting a um, funding proposal for research or you're you're initiating some research that might generate re, um, might generate some evidence in line with our ARI get in touch um, as well as um, if you if there's projects um, that you can identify for collaboration co-creation and thirdly is um, I've touched on it but taking part in data first uh, opportunities via seminars and fellowships and that's a slightly different route to get in touch and finally, um, on the final slide, some tips for engaging with us. Uh, so firstly, familiarise yourself with MOJ's areas of research interest. Um, keep up to date with what our priority evidence gaps are and consider how your research and your, level, your expertise fits within that, that landscape. Um, secondly, uh, consider uh, demonstrate an awareness of the wider policy context and, and government ways of working. So one of the functions of the hub is to bring academics and policymakers together and, and to start talking a, a bit more in a, a common language, if you like, uh, to demonstrate an awareness of the, the policy context and the wider societal context within which the, the department is working. Um, okay. And what's particularly important here is considering the accessibility of um, your evidence and, and how you present these in order for policymakers to understand what the real world implications of this evidence is. Um, and then finally, make use of existing networks. Uh, UPenn has been touched on, uh, uh, but we also engage um, with UPenn as well as uh, and we have a partnership with CAPE, uh, Capabilities and Academic and Policy Engagement, who have a partnership with Consortium of Academics. And some of those uh, engagement activities are disseminated um, via those networks too. So make use of existing networks, but also make use of um, guidance on engaging with government. Um, there's lots of guidance out there and I've included just a couple of really good examples for you. So um, we had loads of questions in whilst you were speaking. So the first one is, could you just say a little bit more about how academics can join the Ministry of Justice academic network? Quite a few people are asking about that. Uh, sim simply get in touch with uh, the email that's um, on the slide before this one. If you just if you just get in touch um, and and say you you've heard about the academic network and you would like to get involved, one of our team will send you um, a form to give you a little bit more information about what the academic network is, and. Um, and you just fill out some details around uh, your research interests and how they align with the uh, MOJ's ARI um, and some of your your skills and things and then and then essentially it goes from there but it's as simple as dropping us an email. Lovely thank you so much. Uh, another question here so can you talk about how you see the role of various hubs as part of a wider research ecosystem? Uh, so, for example, are they about increasing the proportion of research that leads off from government research questions or are they interested in wider work, for example? Oh, that's a uh, good question. Um, I s and I'm not sure uh, how to answer it. I We're at relatively early days. I see it as, um, I, but I think there's room for both, essentially. Um, it's not just around uh, it's not just around developing the evidence uh, against our, our research priorities. It's also about helping us um, advance on our 
on our methodological techniques. Um, and uh, so we're also interested in um, in advancing in, in advancing the conceptual and uh, technical side of um, of the work too. Another question here is uh, how has the hub influenced policy thus far? And just asking if, if you're able to give any examples um, about what led to that outcome, if so. So the hub itself as a um, cross-cutting team um, is is more around um, embedding the, the culture change that we want to see. Um, so uh, making uh, policy makers consider evidence first um, and make it a sort of way of working for policy facing analysts and policy makers themselves to reach out to um, external experts. Um, so the hub itself doesn't has hasn't had in its in its sort of um, in its early days had that direct impact on policy, but that is not, of course, to say that evidence hasn't uh, shaped policy um, within the department. But the the hub itself is quite new. Before the hub was developed, um, the engagement with academics. Um, and research partners was kind of ad hoc and variable across the department. Um, some were it and and uh, some some teams were excellent at it. Some teams wouldn't even consider, you know, reaching out to see to see where the latest um, see what the developments are in the evidence base. So we've been set up to to make it not a nice to have um, to make sure that this is part of people's ways of working. I don't want to say that evidence has not ever led to policy decisions because of course that's what the whole of DASD is a, is a, is about but the hub it, the hub itself is more around um driving those um those new ways of working or accelerating those new ways of working by providing um a framework around a framework and a dedicated team to support people in to deliver those ways of working just do one more question for now. Um, somebody is asking, uh, does every ministry have a data and analytical services team like yours um, or do you know if that is just unique to the MOJ? Um, it's definitely not unique to the MOJ. There'll be, um, but the the um, size and specific functions of an different analytical teams will vary across government departments. So we, our, our DASD function is centralised, um, but others, um, other analysts within different departments are embedded within policy teams. Um, there's different, there's pros and cons of different ways of working. But as I said, the size and the uh, scale of um, analytical functions will vary, um, but uh, there are, um, yes, there are analysts in um, each uh, major government department. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you, Laura, for keeping an eye on the questions there. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating to listen um, to all the questions and answers coming in. So we've heard from Julia and Catherine um, at the Government Office for Science. We've heard from Amy from a Ministry of Justice about the different ways that those parts of government uh, work with experts um, and some opportunities for you to feed your uh, expertise in and some tips from them about how you might want to work with those parts of government as a researcher. And I think there's some really interesting tips that chime with what we uh, talk about when we talk about working with Parliament as a researcher as well. Uh, it's a lot about connections and networks. Uh, UPEN has been mentioned. Um, if your institution, if you don't know if your institution is a part of UPEN, the University's Policy Engagement Network, then we'd really encourage you to uh, to find out whether they are part of UPEN because it's a really great network um, and a way to feed in to all parts of policy. Uh, we've also heard something about CAPE. Um, as as well as that project so it's great to see that different parts of government are all plugged into that and we are as well 
Um, if you would like a bit more information about how to work with Parliament as a researcher, because remember that split between Parliament and government, we have got absolutely loads of information online. Um, on your screens now is um, the address of our web hub, uh, parliament.uk slash research hyphen impact. And on there you will find lots of how to guides, um, lots of information about why engage with Parliament as a researcher and um, some tips and advice on there. And uh, we also have recordings of uh, lots of other training sessions. Some of you may have been to them. Uh, we have training sessions tailored for PhD students, for early career researchers, uh, for academics, for knowledge mobilizers, and we've got some thematic ones as well. So we have uh, training on how to engage with select committees, how to write for a parliamentary audience, that kind of thing. So head over to there if you want uh, to watch a little bit more training or explore some more about engaging with parliament as opposed to the government departments we've heard from today. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you can follow us on Twitter as well, because we put on there any opportunity we can find for researchers to work with Parliament. Uh, there will be various government feeds that you can follow as well about working with government. And if you're interested in any more about working with Parliament um, as a researcher, then you do have us, the Knowledge Exchange Unit. Uh, that's myself, it's Laura who you've met today, and it's Sarah who's been uh, in the background too. Um, we are on the end of this email address keu at parliament.uk. So if you want some more advice about working with Parliament as a researcher or if you want some useful links about anything you've heard today then we're really happy to to help you out with that as well. I really hope that you found the information that we've given you today useful. We've given you a little bit of an insight into how different parts of government work, how they use research and how you as a researcher can get involved. Thanks again for your time and we'll be in touch soon.